Hello, everybody, and good morning this beautiful Sunday morning. I know it's been raining off and on this weekend, but hey, the Lord blesses us with flowers in the spring, and they require water. And as we see the regeneration of the earth around us, may we know for certain that we serve a powerful and mighty and wonderful God. Glad you're with us here at First Baptist Church again this Sunday morning. We are going to be picking up in our study in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to start with verses 11 and 12 here in just a minute. But before we get started, I hope that each and every one of you is continuing to pray, uh, not only for a resolution and a swift end to the pandemic that we have with the coronavirus, but also for one another. Uh, we're definitely in a time in our country as well as in our communities and in our families that we need that support. So let's go to the Lord today in prayer. Dear gracious and heavenly Father, as we come this day to you, Lord, we do so very humbly, seeking your face and your will in our life as well as for direction. But Lord, we have many who are on our hearts and minds this day those who are suffering uh, from this disease, others who are suffering from cancer or other illnesses, Lord, we just pray for the strength for each and every one, for their families. We pray for our leaders in our country, as well as in our state and local areas. And Lord, we just pray for one another as a church family. As we've seen in this uh, study of Corinthians, that we as a family always need to be praying for one another and lifting one another up in all these times and in all of the things that we face and the challenges and the trials that we have. Lord, we do thank you for all of that, and we ask now that your Holy Spirit help guide us and direct us in this study. And we ask this all in our precious Lord and Savior's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, everybody. Well, let's go ahead here and pick up where we left off. And that'll be with verses 11 and 12. But let's go ahead and read 11 through 18. And then let's go back and let's start looking at these verses a little bit more in detail. I have, come, I have become foolish. You yourselves compelled me. Actually, I should have been commended by you. For in no respect was I inferior to the most eminent apostles, even though I am a nobody. The signs of a true apostle were performed among you with all perseverance by signs and wonders and miracles. For in what respect were you treated as inferior to the rest of the churches, except that I myself did not become a burden to you? Forgive me this wrong. Here for this third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be a burden to you, for I do not seek what is yours but you, for children are not responsible to save up for their parents, but parents for their children. I will most gladly spend and be expended for your souls. If I love you more, I am to be loved less. But be that as it may, I did not burden myself, you myself. Nevertheless, crafty fellow that I am, I took you in by deceit. Certainly I have not taken advantage of you through any of those whom I have sent to you, have I? I urged Titus to go, and I sent the brother with him. Titus did not take in any advantage of you, did he? Did we not conduct ourselves in the same spirit and walk in the same steps? So let's go back to verses 11 and 12 here. What is continuing to happen here is that when Paul established the church here in Corinth, he performed the signs of an apostle. We're talking miracles, the supernatural evidences that proved his authority as an apostle in Jesus Christ. But what he is getting now is that people are doubting him. They are not holding him in the same light. Again, these false teachers have come in to the church and have been pulling them astray. And so Paul, again, is a very crafty person, especially when it comes to the art of argument and persuasion in this particular case, as he lays the foundation of his story for these people and explains things to them. 
in verses 14 and 15, I have a question for you. Have you ever done all that you could for someone, only for them to abuse you, to treat you poorly? This is what is happening to Paul. The people that he tried to lift up, edify, tried to teach the way of Jesus Christ, have now turned their backs on him. And so what we see is that Paul suffered loss to ensure their growth as a church and their well-being. However, as a church, as people, individuals, they in return, they failed to show Paul the same level of love. Love ever flows downward. You know, the second greatest commandment asked of Jesus, the first he said was to love your God, and the second was to love thy neighbor as thyself. So each and every one of us is called to love our neighbor. And so what did Paul do? Paul tried to remove the financial burdens of an early organization by not demanding any help or assistance from the Corinth church. These false teachers then came in and made that a point that he wasn't even worthy of being paid. He was such a bad teacher. He was such a bad apostle. He was such a bad leader. And so in this process, they have been fooled. And again, Paul is trying to reach out to them. But you know, if we always are trying to love one another, could you imagine what this world would be like if we were always loving instead of bitter, um, you know, jealous, and the other things that we experience in life? One of the things I want us to note here is that often there is a carnal pride in people which makes them resent the bestowal of money or the rendering of a service which puts them under obligation. You know, when I took Appalachian studies, one of the things that it talked about was in the Appalachian region, which we would be a part of, that they did not like to owe anyone at any time. And I think a lot of folks feel that way now. They don't want to owe anyone so that they don't feel obligated. And that's one of the things that we need to realize. But you know, we are obligated. We should be lifting up one another as Christians, as a brotherhood and sisterhood of fellow Christians. We're called to edify one another. And we're going to get into that as we get into some more studies down the road here in the upcoming weeks. But at the same time, we see here at this point, Paul again is trying to re-engage our Christian church here in Corinth and encourage them once again to start back down the pathway of godly and righteous living, which including loving everyone. In 16 and 17, we see that Paul, again, is crafty. And here's this. What was Paul's true trick here in these verses, as we saw and read these? He tricked them into not supporting him. And as we, again, we, he did that for a reason. You know, this was a very young church, and he wanted them to get up and grow, so he didn't want to be a burden on them. And through his sarcasm, if you read that, Paul vindicates himself against the charge of trickery and fraud. There have been a lot of frauds in the world. There's been a lot of trickery, and people still to this day are trying to trick people out of their money, out of their belongings, as well as other things. And so you always have to be on guard for them. But again, you know, a lot of times people say uh, uh, the Bible doesn't have its moments. But here is a moment where, again, we see sarcasm, and in this case, from Paul. Now, let's go ahead and read our final verses 19 through 21 here. All this time you have been thinking that we are defending ourselves to you. Actually, it is in the sight of God that we have been speaking in Christ and all of your upbuilding be loved, for I am afraid that perhaps when I come, I may, not fi I may find you to be not what I wish and may be found by you to not be what you wish, that perhaps there will be strife, jealousy, angry, tempers, disputes, slanders, gossip, arrogance, disturbances, 
I am afraid that when I come again, my God may humiliate me before you, and I may mourn over many of those who have sinned in the past and not repented the impurity, the immorality, and the sensuality which they have been practicing. So what is Paul saying here in these verses 18 through 21? That we must see the issue of sin that were prevalent inside the church. And we know that we are to called to live a righteous life. We are to make sure that worldly cultures do not influence our behaviors. And you know, we see that in America now. That human culture is dividing the church. It's dividing the church over different types of matters that involve immorality. And the Bible is very specific that we are not to indulge in that. We are to call it a sin, and it is to remain a sin. And we are not to endorse it, nor are we to support it. We're to stand our ground. And then again is what we're seeing here with Paul, with this church. Now, I want us to look at a couple of things here this evening. I want us to first go to Galatians chapter 5. So if you would, let's go ahead and flip over just a few pages to Galatians chapter 5. We're going to read 16 through 26. And this is talking about the relationship of the flesh and the Holy Spirit. So we want to pick up again uh, here in verse 16 through 26. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desires against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, adultery, sorcery, immimitites, strife and jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissension, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I forewarn, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But listen here. This is where we kick in as Christians. This is what we should be showing. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. Again, we see in the writings here that as Christians, that these characteristics should set us apart from the world. Because if we're showing these things, love and joy and patience and peace and kindness, that we are good and we're faithful to the Lord and we're gentle and we have self-control, then we're not living like the world. But more importantly, if we're doing these things, then we are living a more righteous life. And that is obedience that we are supposed to be doing through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. He calls us to be obedient. And we see it here in these words. Now, I want us to flip over for one more time, if you don't mind. And let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. A few more pages, not many. Just a few more. 1 Thessalonians 5. Now, I'm going to read this whole chapter as we are getting to the point of finishing chapter 12 because this, as I was an early Christian, was taught to me to be really the Christian commandments. And those commandments will pick up in verses 12 through 26. And as we go through them, I want you to listen to what God is calling you as a Christian, what you are to do, how you're supposed to be living. 
Because that is going to show who you truly are. And that is a child of God. Let's start and do the precursor in all of this because, again, it's talking about the teaching of the Lord, talking about God. And then we're going to get into what, again, I was told years and years ago is really the Christian commandments. God created the Ten Commandments for everybody, but definitely for the heathen of this world so that they know how to act. But we are called to a higher standard, and we're going to get into that. Let's start on it. Now, as to the times and the epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness. They, the day would overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do. Let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and is a helmet the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another just as you are doing. Now, there is the start as we're getting into these Christian commandments. Build one another up. Encourage one another. Let's keep on digging. But we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction and that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. So we see here already that we are to be respectful of our leaders, of our pastors, and so we're also supposed to edify them and encourage them, and we are to live as a body of people, the believers, in peace with one another. Now let's go on. We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly. Discipline each other, especially those who are out of line. Encourage the faint-hearted. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. So again, encouraging those who are weak in faith, those who may have had a lot of burdens on their lives and are struggling with their faith, you're supposed to help them. You're supposed to edify them. Lift them up. In addition to that, we are to be patient. See that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek that after that which is good for one another and for all people. You know, it was just a few weeks back that Pastor Ryan was preaching about the saying of turn one cheek to the other. And let them hit the other cheek, if that is how they're going to be. And what it was really telling them is that, again, you don't repay evil for evil. You repay evil with love. Because that's what Jesus would do. And what we realize, the evil that was done to him right before he died on the cross, what did he do? He went to the cross anyway. Because he wanted to die for your sins and mine so that we can be connected again with him through the salvation of the blood of Jesus Christ. But we have to call upon him as our Lord and Savior. And if we do that, we share in that. But that is an example of what we're talking about, the love that overcame the evil before him. Listen to this. Rejoice always. How often have we, as Christians, been so joyous and happy that people would be like, what is in with you? You're happy because God has showed you his love and his mercy and his kindness. 
He has blessed you with all kinds of things. Don't take advantage of those things. Rejoice always in the fact that he is with us. Pray without ceasing. Again, one of the staples of our Christian faith is communication with God, talking with Him through prayer. And so I encourage you to listen to these things because, again, the people who are lost of this world, they're not asked to do these things. You and I are asked to do these things because we are Christians. Listen to this. And everything give thanks. So with the good and the bad, you're to give thanks. You're to be like Job. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And this is the one that I love. Verse 19. Do not quench the Spirit. Some of your Bibles may say the Holy Spirit. You know, when the Holy Spirit is leading us as a church, leading us as individuals to do things, we need to seek ways to do what the Holy Spirit is guiding us to do. Don't quench it by saying you're too busy, oh, I really don't want to do that. It says right here, as a Christian, you are not to tell the Spirit no. You are to let the Spirit lead, guide, and direct you. Do not despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Now, may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. And may your spirit and your soul and your body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls you, and he also will bring it to pass. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all with the brethren with a holy kiss. I adjourn you by the Lord to have this letter read to all the brethren. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Again, we see, again, what I was always told were the commandments for the Christian. Pray all the time, not to squelch the Holy Spirit, to edify one another, to encourage one another, to build each other up, pray all the time, Stay away from evil, and at the same time, we are to love one another as well as our leaders. You know, and that brings us to an end of our study here. And um, it's uh, been a good study. I think Corinthians has a lot of powerful messages in it. If you haven't had a chance to be with us through this entire time, we in the and the church would ask you to go back and reread from 1 Corinthians on through 2 Corinthians what Paul was doing with the Corinthians and what was being said. There are a lot of key things in there that we should live by and, and review on a regular basis. I want to again thank everybody for being with us. I hope you've had a blessed week. I hope that you continue to stay safe. Do the things that you need to do to protect yourself. And as everybody, I long for the time when we can be back together, fellowshipping one another, hand in hand, side by side. But it's just a short period of time here that we continue to need to stay it apart. But again, uh, they say that uh, absence makes the heart grow fonder. And I look forward to being with you all again soon. And I just pray as we go uh, today that, again, God blesses you and keeps you safe. Let's bow our heads. Dear gracious and heavenly Father, as we have seen through Paul's work and through your words this day, that you call us to be better than the world around us so that we can make our light shine. Lord, we do pray for our church family, for our world as well as our nation. You have told us in your word that if we as a people would turn from our evil ways and turn to you and to pray that you would heal our land. Lord, we do pray for that healing power. We do pray, Lord, for your Holy Spirit in our lives. And Lord, we pray that you will guide us as a church and as individuals. Keep us safe, Lord, until we have a chance to be in your house and be one with one another again. 
For it's in Jesus' holy name we do pray. Amen.